How is everyone this morning? Y'all look good. <laughs> Listen, I want to ask you a question this morning. Did you come this morning to celebrate Easter? Or did you come this morning to celebrate Christ? That's right. Celebrate Christ, right? And His resurrection. And the reason I ask you this, I was in the doctor's office the other day and I saw this sign. Nikki, you have that up there? I saw this sign and as I was reading it, you know, it says Happy Easter down there at the bottom. And a few other things that it says. It says, you know, spring, hippity hop, egg hunt, basket, flowers, fun, 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 jelly beans. You see Jesus on there anywhere? No. No, no mention of Jesus. And I thought to myself, you know, this is what Easter means to a lot of people. We made it about a bunny. We made it about eggs. We made it about fun, fun, fun. And listen, fun, fun, fun is good. We're, as soon as we leave here, we're going to go spend time with some family. We're going to have a good time. But this day that we are celebrating today, church, the reason for it is we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Not, not a holiday. He didn't, listen, we didn't wake up this morning and Jesus rose on April 1st of 2018. He rose over 2,000 years again ago. Three days after His crucifixion. And you know, I, I believe that there's probably many people who will sit in churches today. And they don't know the significance of the resurrection. And what it means to the believer. It's special to us, church. And, you know, it's important. I mean, without the resurrection, there is no victory. There is no victory over death. And today, I want to focus on that message, okay? I want to focus on the message of the resurrection. So if, you're, if you have your Bibles open, let's go ahead and turn this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, here the Apostle Paul is having to correct a lot of issues that the church in Corinth have, have, uh, have out of order. And he's dealing with a lot of issues. But on this particular instance, he is speaking to them on the resurrection and what it means to the believer. And that without it, church, he says that without it, their faith is futile. And what I want to do, I, I know that, you know, in... Preaching one on one, they tell you that you know that a good sermon has a, 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 a three, no more than three points. Okay. Well, I'm gonna preach two sermons to you this morning because I've got six that I want to make. Okay. Because you know what, there's so much that we can pull out of this chapter, and you know, as I was studying and I was preparing this week and going over this chapter, I told Nikki, I said, Nikki, I feel like I'm gonna have to preach on the whole chapter. You know. Not sure how I want to get through that. Because listen, everything that Paul's making mention of here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is it's important that we understand it, that we know it, church. Because I know, and as I've been preaching over the past couple of weeks on suffering, and because I know that many within our congregation, there's many that are not here this morning because they're either in the hospital and or in recovery and and other issues, and there's a lot going on in our lives right now. But Paul says that because of the resurrection, that even in the midst of suffering, there's hope. There is hope. Amen. So what I want to do this morning is I'm going to kind of go through, I just picked out a few different sections here, a few different verses that we're going to stop, we're going to kind of go over and talk about just for a moment. But before I get started, I would like for us to pray. So would you please bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you, not for who you are to us, Lord, for what you mean to us, Lord. And Father, we thank you for Jesus, Lord. We thank you that, that he did die on the cross, but he did not stay in the grave, Lord. But he rose from the grave, Lord, and, and conquered that power that death had over us, Lord, because he had conquered sin at the grave, Lord. Father, we thank you, Father, that we are here today, Lord, to, to remember that day. Father, forgive us, Lord, if... If ever we forget it, 
Father, the resurrection should be something that, God, that we are mindful of, of all of the time, Lord, not just one day out of a year. So, Father, I pray that this morning, God, that you would speak and minister to our hearts, Lord, through your word. Father, I pray that you would open our understanding to it, Father, God, that we may be able to receive it. That your Holy Spirit, God, would minister to our hearts, Lord. That he would reveal your word to us, Lord. I pray, God, for myself that you would set me aside, Lord, use me as a vessel, Father, for you to use, for you to work in and through, God. God, we thank you. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. 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 So let's start with looking at verses 1 through 4 this morning. And the first point that I want to make, church, is this. Is that they had heard, they had believed, and they were saved. In the first four verses, Paul says this. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What Paul is telling the church here in Corinth is he's, he's saying you know the message that was delivered to you, the gospel, the good news. That message that Christ died for your sins, that, that He was buried and on the third day He rose again. And he says by that you were saved. You know I was thinking about in Romans chapter 1 where Paul says that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who would believe, he says, first for the Jew then also for the Gentile. See, Paul had, knew that his responsibility was to bring the Word. And what happened in Corinth was they responded to the Word, the Gospel, and they were saved. And on that Gospel is what they stood on. But yet there was something being taught within the church of Corinth that caused them to, to not believe in the resurrection of the dead. See, Paul says that, that you have heard this message, you have... You have received this message. You have believed this message. And he says there's evidence to back it up. He goes on to talk about how, uh, how there was witnesses who had witnessed the resurrection of Christ. How first it was shown that he appeared to Cephas or to Peter. And then to the twelve. And then he appeared in one instance to, to over five hundred. And then again, he appeared to James, the brother of Jesus, and to all the apostles. And then he says, lastly, he appeared to me. And what Paul was doing was he, was, he was setting them up for, listen, you know that he is risen, that he is alive. And, and listen, if you don't believe me, you can go ask them. There were over 500 witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. Today in a court of law, if there's, a, if there's an eyewitness, one or two, listen, that's enough to, to sentence a man to prison for the rest of his life or even to death or to set him free. But it's enough in a court of a law. But yet, we struggle with the fact is, is there a resurrection? You know, I was going over, just looking through some things on the, on the internet and I came across a, an old... Um, Rasmussen study where they put out this um, study to see how many people in America really believed in the resurrection. And in 2012, it's, they came up with a percentage, and it was 77% of Americans believed in the resurrection. And then I read another one that was from 2013, and with this in a, within a year's span, that number dropped from 77% to 62%. You can only imagine what that number is today, church, of who believes in the resurrection of Christ. And can I tell you that, listen, that lack, that, 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 that dropping in that number, I can't help but take some of the responsibility of that. As a minister of the gospel, as someone who has been called to preach the gospel, to lead a flock, is that, listen, the church is responsible, church, for the lack of understanding of the resurrection because we've made it all about a holiday. We've made it all about a holiday. 
we've lost the true meaning of the resurrection. Paul said, listen, if you don't believe me, there's plenty of witnesses for you to go to. Our witnesses who saw his resurrected body. They could have asked Thomas. Thomas put his hand in his side. But he says now, and let's pick up on my six, six second point here. And, and the second point I want to bring out is because he lives, we too shall. I mean, because he lives, we have eternal hope. If you jump down to verse 12, starting with verse 12, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 19. Paul goes on to say, he says, Now if Christ is preached, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because he, we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. See, Paul says that, that if Christ is not preached, then this message that, that I'm giving my life for, that I'm putting my life on the line for, is all for nothing. It means nothing. It's futile. And your faith, your faith is futile if, Christ, if in fact Christ has not risen. Church, it's, it's all dependent upon the resurrection of Christ. You see, it's the death at the cross where He bore our sins and, and our penalty upon Himself. But it's also the resurrection. Because the two go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. There's no benefit of the cross if there was no resurrection. And Paul is telling them that, listen, if, if the Christ is not risen and the, there is no resurrection of the dead, then where is your hope? He says that, listen, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we're of all men to be the, the, the most pitiable. But listen... The world has every right to pity us. Because we're believing in something that is not true. But can I ask you this morning, is it true, church? Has Christ risen? Has He risen? Yes, He is absolutely risen. Paul goes on to say in verse, in verse 42, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, in verse uh, 20, in verse 20 he says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Third point I want to make is this. Because He lives, we too shall live. Amen. You see, our hope is not in this life. Our hope is in the life after. Right. The promise that we have of eternal glory. To live in His presence forevermore. And Paul, what Paul was saying in verse 19 is if we cling to this life, if this is all we have, then really we have no hope. Because I think we can all be honest, right, and say that, listen, this life can be difficult. This life is full of hardship, full of loss. Now there's, listen, there's plenty of opportunity to have great joy in this life. I'm not taken away from that. But we know that this life can be hard. Paul says that if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men to be the most pity. But now Christ is risen from the dead, he says in verse 20, and, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first, the first fruits, church, meaning that he's the first that was raised from the dead and resurrected and ascended into heaven. But he's not the last. For those who are in Christ, too, whenever that last trumpet is, is, is shouted, it says in 1 Thessalonians, that, that whenever the Lord descends from heaven and with the shout of the, of the archangel and the, and the sound of the trumpet, that, that the dead in Christ will rise first. He goes on to say here in verse, in verse 21, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. 
But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. The first fruits were offered, were offered after, the, uh, after the Passover feast. And they were offered as a first fruits, an offering of, of the harvest that was to come. And this harvest that Paul is talking about, he's not talking about wheat. He's talking about souls. He's talking about us that are born again and bought. Blood purchased believers in Christ Jesus. And he's saying that Jesus is the first fruits. But listen, after that, church, one day we too shall rise into eternal glory. We too shall be in the presence of the Lord evermore for eternity. The fourth point that I want to make is this. Because He lives, our suffering is not in vain. Our suffering is not in vain. Jump down with me, if you would, over to verse, uh, to verse 29. Looking at verses 29 through 34, Paul has this to say. He says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And you know, I want to clarify that for a moment. Paul wasn't talking, wasn't encouraging baptizing for the dead. He was talking about another false a false idea that you could be baptized for the dead and they could receive their salvation by your baptism. And that is not the gospel. Paul had already given us the gospel in, in the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Right? In Romans chapter 10, Paul says that if you confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. That whoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, that choice to, to receive Christ Jesus as your Lord has to be made here. And, and, and listen, nobody can make it for you. It's a personal decision that is made between the person, the individual, and God. But Paul goes on to say in verse 30, and he says, And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? He says, I firm." By the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Now, Paul wasn't talking about that dying to his flesh here. He was talking about his life being in jeopardy every day. Paul suffered great hardship. Paul went through great hardship. He was stoned and left for dead. He was in prison, beaten. And he had a target on his back because he was a minister of the gospel. And he had people who were hunting him down all the time. He would have to go from place to place because he was having to avoid somebody who was trying to take his life. And he says, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts in Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Paul is saying that, listen, that if there is no resurrection, then why would I be putting myself through such hardship? I mean, if there is no resurrection, then we might as well just live, eat, drink, and die. I mean, do whatever you want. Because your faith is futile if there is no resurrection. It's all for nothing. But Paul says, but he has risen. He is alive. He is alive. And he says this. Amen. He says this in verse 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Paul says that, listen, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. What is he saying? <laughs> that because Christ is risen, because Christ is risen, we should not be deceived in thinking that, listen, we can just do whatever we want to do in this life without any consequences or any judgment. Right. Paul is saying that, listen, because He lives and He rules and He reigns, and listen, can I tell you another benefit of the resurrection? Is that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says of Himself, He says, He's selling, talking to His disciples and they're asking Him about Him saying that He is having to leave them. And, 
And Jesus responds to them. He says that it is better for you that I leave because when I leave, I will send the Comforter. He will send the Holy Spirit. And the moment of our confession of faith in Ephesians chapter 2, it tells us that the moment that we confess Christ Jesus our Lord, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit within us brings about conviction. And what Paul is talking about here is he's saying, Awake to righteousness and do not sin. Live as if, listen, you're serving a resurrected King. A resurrected Lord. And he goes on to say, he goes on to say, Awake to, awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. The fifth point that I want to make is this. And it's found in verses 42 through 44. Because He lives, we will be raised in incorruption. And that is, I don't know about you, but that's good news, church. That is good news. It says here, starting with verse 42, it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in incorruption. It is raised in, I mean, incorruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. I don't know about you, but I woke up this morning with some aches and pains. I woke up this morning with some back pain that I've been dealing with and struggling with now for a few weeks. What Paul is saying is that, listen, this body that we have received to live out this life in, it's temporary. It's, it's just a temporary dwelling. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. He says, for we know, and you know, Paul was always pretty confident in what he was saying, wasn't he? I mean, Paul believed what he preached. And he says, for we know that if this earthly house, this tent, meaning a temporary dwelling, if it is destroyed, we have a building from God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This tent that we are living in is temporary. Amen. It's perishing. That's why we wake up with aches and pains. That's why we grow old. That's why we die. But listen, the benefit of the resurrection, because He lives, we will inherit an eternal body. Incorruptible. Eternal. Eternal church. That's good news. Hallelujah. To know, listen, I'm not going to be waking up with any pain, any aches anymore. Man, that's good news. Amen. I knew I'd get some amens out of that. Right? <laughs> Fifth point that I want to make is this. It's because He lived, lives, death is swallowed up in victory. In verses 40, uh, 54 through 58, Paul says this. He says, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, yeah. oh death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Right. If you were to jump back over to verse 26, in verse 26, Paul says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. He had just been talking about how when Jesus will establish God's kingdom, eternal kingdom, and He will put all His enemies under His feet. And that last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And, and church, that is what we are here to celebrate this morning is that Christ defeated death. And that we have eternal life through Christ Jesus. Can I tell you that we're all created eternal beings? All of us. And you will either spend eternity with Him or separated from Him in eternal hell. Well, the Bible describes that place as a place of gnashing of teeth, of eternal fire, eternal torment. But Jesus defeated death in the grave so that you and I, by faith, can enter in through Christ Jesus and have an eternal inheritance waiting for us. Amen. 
where Jesus says, I have gone to prepare a place for you. And that, listen, church, the only access that we have to that is through Christ Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Yes. And that no one will enter into the Father except through Him. And He has opened the way for us. He has entered in behind the veil into the Holy of Holies once and for all, that last, that permanent, that final sacrifice for all sin. And you and I can, as believers in Christ Jesus, we can boldly approach the throne of grace yes. in our time of need. And find grace there, church. Because He lives. Because He has defeated death in the grave. That's good news, church. And listen, that is the hope that we live for. The hope that we have in Christ. That listen, that we have the opportunity to come to Him because of the Gospel, His death, His burial, His resurrection. We can come to Him in faith and have an eternal inheritance. That we, that we can have hope in the midst of hardship and great trials because He lives. Because we don't cling to this life because we know that the life to come is the life that we are living for. It's our hope. You know, in, a, in, in Hebrews chapter 11... When, when the writer of Hebrews is talking about the great patriarchs of the faith and, and, he, and he starts with Abel and then he talks about Noah and he talks about Enoch and then he talks about Abraham and, and Sarah. But then he says, he says, and these, he, he said, and these, they, they, they were looking for a home that was not where they were, but it was a home they were headed to. And that is the picture, church, of us as Christians, as believers in Christ. This is not our home. We're living for a home beyond this. Where Christ is. Amen. And He's prepared a way for us. And because He lives, we too shall live incorruptible with Him for eternity. And Church, when we talk about celebrating the resurrection, we, we are talking about the benefit that we have through Christ Jesus. Right. That because He lives, we too shall live. Because He lives, He has opened up the door for us to have eternal life. And that He is the only way. So I want to encourage you this, this morning that when we leave here and we go and we celebrate with our families, listen, enjoy it. Remember that this day that we are celebrating, we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Who defeated death in the grave that you and I may have an eternal inheritance, inheritance to inherit. That we may live with Him eternally forevermore. Amen. Man, that's something to rejoice about this morning, church. Hallelujah. If you would, please stand. We're open up a time of invitation, and I want to encourage you this morning. Listen, if you're here this morning, I do this every Sunday. If you're here this morning, and you've never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, the opportunity is here. It's awaiting you this morning. Would you come? There's grace waiting you this morning. If you but call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. here this morning and you've been suffering, struggling with something in your life and you feel felt like you have lost all hope this morning you can have hope because we serve a risen King a risen Lord and when things seem like there is no hope you can remember that there's a hope waiting for you and because there's a hope waiting for you, you can endure this life in its hardships and in its struggles. Because this life is but a vapor, is what the Bible tells us. It's temporary. That is eternal. I saw a preacher give an illustration one time where he had this 100 foot rope stretched out. And on the very end of it, about two inches of it was some tape that 
And he said that this two inches represents your life. He says the rest of this represents eternal life with him. But he says the problem is, is that so many live for this. For this temporary time that we have here on this earth. They, they put it all into this. Not even thinking about the eternal life that they have in Christ Jesus. You know, I've heard it said that, that some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I don't agree with that at all. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I feel like that there are some people who are so earthly minded that they're no heavenly good. Don't cling to this life. This life will let you down. But listen, Jesus will never will. Cling to Him. Make Him Lord of your life. Come this morning. The invitation's open. Rise up. Pray through this song. If you need prayer, I'll be standing.
us. Listen, we need to be praying for one another, okay? Uh, we know that the victory is in Him, right? Amen. And that because He lives, there's always hope. <coughs> so let's lift each other up in prayer. Uh, I know that we have a few announcements to make, Nikki. Do you